morning in 1 Peter chapter 3, as I understand it, and I appreciate those who took care of the class while we were gone here for a couple of weeks, and we appreciate that. We've just concluded a great week with Danny McKibben each evening with um, a series of meetings this past week, and he did a great job, and we're, we're glad we're glad we had the opportunity to listen to him and to, to be with him. We've known Danny for a long time, and he's a good man and does a lot of good, do, good work. Internationally, he's doing a tremendous amount of work. He's um, was just down in Columbia. In fact, he got back from Columbia the Thursday before our meeting started on Sunday. And he'd been down there for two weeks, and he'd already been in Mexico a few weeks before that, and he's got other things planned for the rest of the year. So he's doing quite a bit of traveling and, um, and work in, in that regard, and um, he's a, he's a ter terrific talent. This morning, though, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, we'll get into that this morning the author um, titles this section instructions for wives and I want to uh, I want to under to help us all understand that there's no you know, I certainly don't have all the answers in this situation okay there's all kinds of combinations and situations that we can deal with and know about but what we want to do today is take a look at what for what Peter has to say relative to this and then take a look at some other things to help us get a get an idea of what God would have us to know about about the, all this all these situations and all all the relationships that we need to worry about. Peter opens up chapter three with the term "likewise," and he uses this in the New American Standard says in the same way. And the question then becomes, what does "likewise" mean? What's Peter driving at here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1? Likewise. Likewise what? What was said before. Okay. And that's exactly the idea. In the same manner. In other words, the idea is what I've just said in chapter 2. Now, what do we pick up in chapter 2? Okay, what do you got? You sure? Okay, all right. All right, yeah, there's, there's the relationships that are talked about there in that section. Peter talks about the servant-master relationship. He talks about Christians relative to the relationship with civil rulers, verses 13 to 17 talks about relationships and how to now we already we talked in those in those areas there's good ones and there's bad ones right and in those situations still the criteria was behave yourself like a Christian behave yourself because it's right in the sight of God so as Peter begins to talk about this in chapter 3 he says likewise in the same manner in the same situations that we've talked about before, take a look at what's going on. In the same manner of what? It's the same manner of, of, of as he's talked about in chapter 2. And then he goes on and he says, Why is being subjection to your own husbands? And now the question becomes, what, is, what does subjection mean? Okay. Other thoughts? Okay, all right. The idea, I think, is the wife is to discharge her godly duty to her own husband. Now, that's, that's, that's a, that's a, that can be a tough assignment, as we know. But what I want to show this morning in, in the providing of, a, of, a, of an atmosphere where this can be done, that's what we as husbands have the responsibility to do so before you guys kick back and say oh, pip, all right he's going to talk about women this morning <coughs> wake up that ain't going to happen <laughs> it ain't going to happen and i'm going to show you why and there's there's a lot of things that we need to take a look at god has a pattern and it's been since virtually the beginning of time and the pattern goes back way long time ago 
when God's pattern for husbands was given back in the Old Testament. And what I want to do is give you an idea here, and for you young guys sitting here listening to this, this I wish I'd heard this 50 years ago. Okay? God's rules hasn't changed. Okay, God's thoughts hasn't changed. What's changed is me. What's dropped the ball is me. What's dropped the ball is you. What I want you to understand, if you don't get anything else out of this class this morning, understand what he's saying here in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. Moses has been told to, to give this information to the children of Israel. And he's communicating to this, to this to them in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land which you are going over to possess it. So that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen to be careful and do it, that you may dwell, that you, it may be well with you, and that you may be, that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, uh, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now we read that verse. And we can blow right by it. Say, so, well, sure, that makes sense. I, I get that. Please understand where he's talking about this. He's saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That pretty much encompasses every aspect of us. Every part about us should have God centered in the middle to understand what it is that we should be doing to serve him. Now why is that important? As we the young guys growing up as we're looking for 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 those that we want to spend the rest of our life with, is that person going to help me get to heaven? Or is that person going to be a problem in me getting to heaven? We need to put that in the equation. We need to look at that. Can I function as a Christian the way God would want me to function as a leader, as a husband, or can I or will it be a problem? And if it's going to be a problem, we need to back away from it and think about some things. Can I function the way the Lord would have me to be in all the things that I do relative to my career choice? relative to the direction I'm going to go in life, where I'm going to live, what I'm go is God going to be in the middle of that? That's what Moses is saying here. You're going to go into the land of promise. And when you go, God said that you can be there because he's promised it to you. But you listen up. I'm still God. I am still God. And I need to be in the center of everything that you are doing in service to me. Now, continue in verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk with them when you sit down in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be as frontlets on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It's to be around us in everything that we're doing. And we as husbands, we as leaders of those families, have the responsibility to do that. It's not something that I can give to my wife. I can't, I can't defer this off to somebody that's, it's my job. I'm the one that God's talking to here. And so we need to listen up as to where God wants us to be in the position of our houses. Okay? And he, we need to understand that God needs to be in the center of everything we're doing. And if he's not, either a husband or if he's not, 
it isn't right. We need to fix it. We need to find out what it is, and we need to fix it. So, as this goes back to the Old Testament, way back in history, God's plan has been in place. And we need to have this firmly ingrained in our brains that God is first. God is, without a question, the center of everything that we need to be doing and considering. Okay? But on, on with this. We see in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What do we normally think about with that verse when we read it? What normally comes to mind? Husbands, love your wives just like Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'm sorry? Should be willing to die for her. No question. Is that what normally comes to mind? And I think that's very true, and it's very right. It shows the deep love that we're supposed to have for our life. Okay. But I want us to understand, I mean, we read that verse, and, and, and you're absolutely dead on right. But there's more to it than that. We go to the end of it, and, and, and surely the climactic action that Jesus went through in the giving of his life for the church is without question the most unbelievable thing that could have happened. And we should emulate that or be willing to emulate that in whatever way that we can. But there's more to it than that. And I want to show you some things this morning. How did Christ love the church? We've already talked about he gave his life for him. How else did he love the church? Now, okay, before we, before we get in too deep to this, and before somebody says, Rod, you're crazy. He hasn't died yet. The church isn't said. I know that. But the people that followed him did what on the day of Pentecost? were baptized for the remission of sins. Why? Because of what the Lord had taught them, what the Lord had showed them, what the Lord had done for them, the message that had been presented, and they responded to it. So I understand the church isn't established yet, but his people are, and his followers are there. And watch what takes place. In these three passages right here, beginning in Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 37, seeing the people he felt compassion them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees the crowd. He looks at them. He understands that they're not totally in gear with what's going on. Like, like sheep wandering around without a leader. And he has compassion on them and he understands the need that they have. A few chapters over in Matthew chapter 14. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Another aspect of what the Lord did for his people. He saw them despaired, despaired because of, 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 the, of their thoughts process. They needed guidance. They saw those who were sick that he needed to heal. And he did. And for chapter 15, verses 32 and 33, and Jesus called to his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry that they might faint on the way. Out of the compassion that he felt for the crowd, for the people, for their well-being, he takes steps to take care of them and provide for them. Three different accounts, three different situations, three different things that are done out of the compassion that he felt for those that were followed. I understand the miracles that he did and the things that were done were done for the purpose to illustrate and to confirm the word that he said was of God and it was truthful and it was the way, but look at the benefit of those that he touched. You can't tell someone who has been healed from their sickness, this just, happened, this just happened to happen this way. They know who healed him. They know what took place. And out of the compassion that the Lord had for them, 
he did that. He also had compassion on the unfortunate. In just a few more chapters over, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 34, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. He didn't have to do that. We don't have to do that if we look at it from a man's point of view. Well, yeah, okay, you can't see. <clears throat> Life's tough. That's sometimes how we feel. Jesus wasn't that way. Jesus wasn't that way. Those that needed help, he could have help, they could have help. And again, the magnitude of the miracle can be, can't be stated enough. If you've never seen before and now you're <coughs> capable of it, it's a huge miracle. It's huge for that to take place. But he had compassion on the city, Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, uh, gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Jesus knew about 40 years down the road, Jerusalem would be wiped off the face of the map. It would be destroyed. And these people weren't listening to what he had to say. And it struck his heart with sadness that that would take place. And so he makes that statement relative to the city. But then one more thought relative to compassion is the compassion for the bereaved. Luke chapter 7, verses 12 to 15. It says, Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. This boy is dead in the coffin. Jesus sees the hurt. Jesus sees the opportunity to do the right thing and does it. The miracle is, goes without saying. It's a whole different league as far as what the miracle did. But the mother has her son back. The son has his life back because of the compassion and the love that Jesus showed. That's what makes up Jesus. That's what we are to emulate as husbands. That's what we are to emulate as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives. Jesus clearly demonstrated that we need, us guys need, compassion. We need to be compassionate toward those, toward our wives. As Hebrews 5.23 says, Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Alright. The question then becomes, do I show the compassion that Jesus showed? And I'll just put it up there right for you right now. No, I don't. Do you? I don't have that feeling that he can see, that he saw. Do you? Why don't I? What's the problem? Well, a lot of the problem is the way we're wired. And it's not an excuse. It's just the way it is. Men look at things one way. Women look at things another. The ability to... that. It is the ability that generally comes naturally for women, but it's the ability that must be learned by men. We logically look at things, we take a look at things and say, how do I solve the problem? And set out to solve it. If it fits, okay. If it don't, okay. We set out, we don't break, we don't look at the other ramifications of this. Problem I read about that was interesting that illustrates this point so well. Businessman is investing money 
in some futures and he comes upon this deal that just was hands down without a question without a doubt going to make money quickly and the return was going to be incredible and so he goes ahead and sets out to do it he comes home and tells his wife I've invested $50,000 in this investment. We're going to get our money back. And he explains that all this has taken place. And she's kind of sitting back there on her chair saying, Ooh, wait a minute. This don't sound right. There's something about this that you're describing to me that doesn't sound like it's, like it's supposed to be. And he says, OK. I mean, I, I, I get it that you've got uh, uh, an idea here that this isn't, this isn't right. I'll go cancel it. He did. He goes back. He cancels, gets out the deal, gets his money back. Things are fine. A month later, a month later, the people that he was going to do the business with are indicted by the federal government, and all of those guys that he was dealing with went off to jail. <coughs> Luck? I don't know. Her intuition, intuition as to what was taking place was good. How she did it, we don't know. How does it happen? We don't know, but the point is it does. And we as husbands need to understand that there's some smartness there that we don't have a clue about. But we better take stock in it. We better take stock in it and understand that there's something out there we need to learn. We don't have it together. I can tell you, we do not. And you young guys that are coming up with this, don't under please understand, there is more to life than what a person looks like. There is more to life than what's under this skin. And it can be helpful to you or it can be the biggest pain you've ever lived through if you don't do it right. You gotta look beyond the surface. And what is this person like on the inside? We're all inside people with an outside appearance. And we need to understand that we need to look deeper than that because the key item in this life is to get from here to heaven. The key responsibility that we have is to get ourselves to heaven, but to get our families to heaven as well. Whether we want to admit to it, own up to it, we are the leaders of those families. And we better understand God expects that. Because that's where it's been. Have I done a good job at that? No, I can tell you that. I've got three kids that have walked away from the Lord. Did I do a good job of that? I don't know. I did the best I thought I could do. But they made the choice. That's going to happen. I understand that. But the words that I'm coming to you with this morning are those from experience. Are from down the road and what I've seen and what I've lived through. God's word is effective. God's word is valid. God's word works. And when we do it his way, it will work. There's one thing I've noticed about, if I may. No problem, go ahead. If I need a break. <laughs> you find yourself making your children go to church, as soon as they get the opportunity, they will leave. If we don't start learning, if we don't start and figure out how to make them love to go, they're going to quit as soon as they get the you're absolutely correct and 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 mark i can't i mean just you guys all know this you can just look around and see the generations that were missing on the seats here you've got grandparents bringing caring kids to church and thank you please continue that but that missing generation is a problem that missing generation didn't get what we were trying to communicate either because as Mark said when they got old enough and said I'm out of here I'm out of here or because we missed it we didn't do the teaching we didn't do what we should have done in a way that made sense you're absolutely correct I appreciate that thank you
key element is they've also got to see you leaving it in front of them too. That's the most essential thing. That's the point of Deuteronomy 6 that I started with. A kid would rather see a sermon any time than hear it. Underline that, put it in your brain. He'd rather see a sermon any time than hear it. He's got to see it in your life. He's got to see it in the way you act. He's got to see it in the decisions you make and the priorities that you make to keep God in the middle of what we're doing. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. When you got children, children need to see just what you said to do wrong. That you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your time. When you love God like that, then you strive to put the right example before your children. What you do is you teach your children to love God above all things and respect <coughs> Him as a father. <coughs> chapter 6 teaches us we're to bring our children up loving the Lord. And if we do that as they get older, they, they will, you know, they may depart, but yet they, they, they know. will learn to love you. Right. And, and you know, it's no guarantee that, you know, my child's not going to hurt. But then, you know, you can talk that child to love God and he knows where to come. Just right. like the prodigal son. He knows where to come back to. And our children will know where to come back to. Yep. That, that's the thing we got to do. And we show that by, as you said, example Exactly, exactly. The other thing that, that, that I don't know if you guys fell into this trap, I sure did, okay? It is not the church's responsibility to be responsible for the religious education of your kid. It is not. Now, we can help, but you just think about the mathematical equals here. How many hours are they in school? Click all that up. How many hours do we have the opportunity to have them in this building to teach them? One, maybe two hours a week if they're here Sunday and Wednesday. Maybe. The numbers don't match at all. And we have the responsibility to undo what the school system is doing to try to get these kids on the road to get to heaven. That's mom and dad's job. I can't, we can't begin to do it all here in this building and fix what is undone as soon as they go to school on Monday morning. So it's my job to take and cement to these kids the, 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 the love that they need to have in serving God. Now, we can't make them do that. We can't make them do that. We can show them. We can try to make that. But they have to make this following the Lord part of them. It has to be part of your life. I can't do it for you. You have to decide, I'm going to put God where he needs to be. And I'm going to keep him there. And that's the choice I have to make. Go ahead, Ben. Well, you know, that's why the Bible points out the truth. You know, nowhere in here that, you know, the Bible teaches us that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They were preaching. But when it comes to an individual family, then the instruction is, is to the father. Teach your children to bring them up. And we can't delegate that. We can't. We, I mean, that is not a delegated item. It's, it's the parents. You're, you're going to be the one to train them because they're going to be a watch of you throughout the week, throughout the months, throughout the years, throughout their life. I know about working hard. I know about putting hours in. I know about all the stuff that stretches out young dads <coughs> as they're trying to make a living for their family. I know about all that. But I also know, I don't care how tired you are, or what's going on at the day, the responsibility I have to teach the kids is still mine. Did I do that? I'll tell you no, I did not. My wife was the one who kept things going for the kids. And it was to my 
I, I didn't know about Deuteronomy 6 like I know it now <laughs> at the time. That's not an excuse. That's just what happened. But we need to understand that God is centered in what we're doing and we need to keep him there. And if things aren't the way God would have them be, the problem's not God. The problem is me. Go ahead, Mark. Right. And maybe not in big things, but for the longest of time in little things, to me, I didn't seem to require that the focus was put on that just be on Do what you want to fulfill, you know, fulfill your thing, do your thing. And when you become a Christian, you get to a certain age, and then you start discovering that to be a Christian you have to deny yourself and look to others you're going to be a problem. Yep. We teach we teach your children that sometimes without not saying a word. Exactly. Because they get what they want. Been there, done that, know exactly what you're saying. You know what I mean? Know exactly what you're saying. And make no mistake, we're being watched at very young ages. It starts way down here. And the teaching and the work that we need to be doing, you can't wait to try to teach a kid about the Lord when he's 10 years old. You can't wait that long. It needed to start when he was about this long to understand who God is, what God has done, and keep that whole thought process going to keep them centered on the Lord. That's our job. That's our job. And what we need to be doing to get it through to our kids, how important the Lord is. How important the Lord is. There are so many examples and so many things we could... I know, I know the room is just sitting full of things with people and examples and thoughts that we've had over the years where things have gone good and where things have not. You can't go back and fix it. Okay? What you can do is take a look at what God would have us do and resolve to fix it with whatever and with whoever we can at this point and go on from there. Grandkids are so important. If that's what we've got, and that's what we've got to work with. Work with it the best you can, and do all you can. Go ahead. It's another way. The devil's been you know, uh, very close to home way, and I feel like that, you know, if you're, you can't get your children to understand, or your children to believe and listen, uh, it's hard to feel like you're being a Christian. You ought to be to start with. You know what I mean? It weakens your own faith. All you can do is continue to do the right thing. It doesn't make any difference that there's never the wrong time to do the right thing. And while your point may be exactly on, you can't seem to get through to them, what, live the life that needs to be lived. Live the life that God would have you live. It's like someone said here a while ago, they may not see it at the minute, but down the road, it'll register. Live the life that God would have you live. 
and take advantage of any opportunity that you have. That you don't always get one, but when you do, take the opportunity to teach and go with it from there. If you can't, if you feel like someone else can maybe do a better job, and I know <laughs> this is the worst example that you can ever think of, but I'll, sh I'll share it with you. We had a son that Linda worked with him. You need to brush your teeth every day. You need to brush your teeth every day. And you know how that goes. Well, you know, sometimes he did, sometimes. He went to the dentist. He goes to the dentist, the dentist cleans his, cleans his, cleans his teeth and so forth. He comes out of the room, he, Mom, Mom, the dentist said, I need to brush my teeth every day. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Sometimes it just takes the message said by somebody else to get through. And sometimes, like I say, that's a, that's a poor, but it worked. I mean, it worked for him. But, you know, we just need to explore any avenue that you think is valid and, uh, and pray. <coughs> can un can un um, underemphasize that enough? Prayer is, you know, the tool that is, that's needed and used uh, for, those, for those kinds of situations. All right, our attitude should be on this thing as we've talked about this, um, uh, that, that we're an ongoing process and still learning. A am I asked our question, asked the question then, am I, am I learning how to do this? Am I learning how to compassionately look at things the way the Lord did? And I'll tell you, it's, it's not easy. And I'm not there by a long shot. Okay? But it's, it's, it's a goal that we need to be looking at and we need to have the idea in mind that it's an ongoing process. You're never going to get to be perfect at it. You're never going to get to feel like you're on top of this. I can handle it no matter what. Life is just going to take your knees out and you're going to fall. So you need to understand it's an ongoing proce process and go with it from there. Jesus ultimately physically died for the church and as has already been pointed out, this is how much compassion he had for me. Please understand, it's me. As you read that, I hope you understand, it's me. Jesus <coughs> died for me. It's huge. That if someone would give their life for me, and he did it out of compassion. He did it out of the love that he had for, his, for us. And so he went to the cross on my behalf. What do we learn out of all of this? Well, I hope we can see that wives can more easily carry out their godly duties when their husbands are serving God God's way, not my way. We need to be looking at this book and understanding how God would want us to live and how God would want us to conduct herself. And it's not about what I think. My what I think don't mean nothing. It's what God, God thinks. And try to see where we need to make correction if we need to and do that. But there's another, another thought here that I want to share with you and ask the question, how should a family serve God? How should a family serve God? In Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 25, in just a few verses, we have such a beautiful passage. It says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not, so that they will not lose heart. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who are mere, merely pleasing men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the, the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. In just a few verses... The family is outlined here as to what it takes to be pleasing to God. 
in just a very simple statement, it talks about what we need to do. Is this easy? Now, if anybody's hand flies up and said, oh, yeah, I got this together. I need to talk to you because I, <laughs> I need to figure out what you know that I don't. Okay? But please understand, God is with us in all of this, and, he got, and God wants this to work. But he wants it to work his way. And he wants us to be smart enough to understand we need to work it his way to be pleasing to be pleasing uh, to him this morning. I've got just a few minutes left here, so maybe we can get into some of the questions. You know, maybe we can take a look at a little of that. Okay? All right. In the question one, it says, we've talked about the term likewise and what it meant. We talked about question two. Unto whom do the wives of be in subjection? And of course, the verse talks about clearly to be in subjection to their husbands. Does verse 1 necessarily infer that God recognizes the marriage where one is a Christian and the other is not? Yes. Absolutely he does. God's laws on marriage covers it all. And he looks at all of it. You bet. That's the word. Now, uh, as we took a look at these verses, uh, verse 1, we need to finish reading the whole thing. Said it in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands as, as that even if, if any of them uh, are disobedient to the word, they may be won by, without the word by the behavior of your wives. It gets us into a little different thought as where we've been this morning. Because it talks about, obviously, the, the first part of the verse, submissive to their husbands and so forth. But then he says, with that, here's the reason why. And we've talked about a little bit of this. Some husbands aren't obedient to the Lord yet. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. If you're thinking about entering into a relationship and a marriage and so forth, and, and your husband or your wife is not a Christian, think about it. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean that it's not going to work. It just means it's got all the potential of the world of having problems because of it. Okay? May not be the case at all, but it can be. And here's what happens as a result of this. Uh, so that your own husband, as so as if he is not, um, any of them are disobedient uh, to the word, may be won without the word by the behavior of their wives. Gets back to the thought that was being mentioned there a while ago that you don't have to preach a sermon to have a sermon presented. You can live a faithful life. You can live a life that's pleasing to the Lord and get the message across just as well or as effectively. When the opportunities arise for them to be taught, obviously that needs, that needs to happen because I love, love the question in point number four. What is the word in the phrase obey not the word and then it's got the word think behind it what's the idea what word is used what is the definition gospel. Huh? Gospel. yes well, God's word God's word is what's talked about here question five can a husband be converted without hearing the word of God be careful Are we going to get a yes, no going here? Is that what we're going to do? <laughs> That's what I thought would happen. We're going to get a yes, no. We're going to. Well, let, me, let me wrap up a minute. All right. Yes, it's going to go that direction because he's seen the character of his wife. And that's going to take him in the direction. But no, it's not going to work unless he hears God's word and responds to God's word that way. They work together in that regard but she can't she can't yeah you're, you're right I mean in that regard that's not going to happen but I but I but I see you I think you get what I'm talking about is that that's going to take him that direction because of her life go ahead you know the Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel well this woman by her good conversation here or her good manner of life she is preaching that lesson that you're talking about mm-hmm 
that's going to lead him. That's planting the seed in him, and then he's going to inquire more about it. And when he does, he's going to find out what he knew, just like Peter when he went to the Gentiles to tell them words whereby thou and thy house Right, right. Good. All right, well, let's, well, let's wrap up here with number five. Well, uh, Mark, we'll start with that on, for, on Wednesday night, okay? All right, appreciate your help on this this morning. It's a good, good class. Thanks for everything.